Hey guys, Dirk of FGI here with the start of a new video series. This is just going to be some budget commander decks followed up by decks that are a little more out of budget. Like for example, this one is Joyra of the Gitu. She's a really, really fun commander to play. She's not like top tier or anything or something you'd see in a quote unquote commander or competitive scene but she is a lot of fun and has some amazing synergy for a surprisingly cheap budget. This deck racks around the $50 mark, so even on a minimum wage job, you can make that in less than a day. So here we go anyways with this. Uh, the first cards on the list are ones that'll show uh, interactions with her suspend mechanic. To go back to her, she reads, the pay two mana, exile a non-land card from your hand to put four time counters on an, an exiled card. Uh, if it doesn't have suspend, it gains suspend. For those who don't know what suspend is, it is a rather obscure mechanic. Didn't really see much time, but uh, it says at the beginning of your upkeep, remove a time counter from that card. When the last is removed, cast it without paying its mana cost. If it's a creature, it has haste. This is a really cool thing. You can be dropping a lot of big creatures really, really fast. Not even creatures, it could be anything. Just high CMC stuff for dirt cheap. Just two mana, and then you wait four turns. Or sometimes you can be waiting less with cards such as the following. With Joyer's Time Bug and Fury Charm, these are easy ways to start removing those suspended counters faster so you can easily get the suspended card out as early as the turn after it was played. Well, the suspended With Joyer's Time Bug, you tap to choose a permanent you control or a suspended card you own, and if it has time counters on it, you can remove it or put another one on it. So this is really cool because you'd say you get your time bug turn two, joy return three, turn four, you're suspending a card or two. And you just tap it to uh, remove those counters even faster to speed up that clock to really put the pressure on the opponents. And with Fury Charm, it's the same thing except you remove two time counters for two mana. Really cool. And if you don't want to be removing time counters, you can also use it to destroy artifacts or give a creature trample if you need to get something through for those finishing points of damage. An amazingly versatile card. Continuing on, we have Rift Elemental, which you can pay two to remove time counters from permanents and to give them plus two plus oh until end of turn. You're not really looking to make him big unless you really need to, but for that two mana to remove a time counter, it's super, super useful. It's just, it's really good. For him being just a one mana creature, you can get him out super easily. Then with our Shivan Sandwich, he's not exactly anything great or worth gawking over, uh, but when he enters, after you suspend him for one mana, or just play him out right, you remove two time counters from a target permanent or suspended card, and, or you can put two on it. Really, really cool card. Helps you speed up once again. Time crafting and clock spinning are kind of the same thing. They're also ones that'll just remove time counters or add them. So, no, nah, that can be really useful. And I know it seems weird, but like, why would you want to add time counters to cards? But there are certain situations where you'd want it to be useful. Like, if you're protecting a board wipe or something like that, you don't want your big things getting wiped out. So you maybe want to wait an extra turn for them to enter. All right. Uh, moving on to these two. These cards are so cool. They really interact really well with Joyra's ability because uh, their suspend costs normally aren't great but you can suspend them with Joyra's ability instead, so for two mana instead of the five mana or more that you'd be spending, while well, instead they get their suspend four, so with the Aeon Chronicler, it's like getting to draw an extra card each turn for four turns, then getting a big old body. So it, it's a win in that book, and for being a very, very cheap 35 cents, both of these are each about the 35 cent mark, 100% worth. For Detrivore, now that one is so fun. I mean, you pay two mana, you get four suspend counters on it, and that just lets you destroy a non-basic land every turn, and this is Commander. You're going to see a lot of non-basic lands, especially in the higher budget decks. Moving on to Timebender. It's a morphing card, it's a creature, and it's just removing two time counters or adding two time counters. Plain and simple. Just threw it in there because I almost forgot about it. Paradox Haze. Now this one, this is a fun card. 
so you get to enchant the player and at the beginning of the enchanted player's first upkeep each turn they get an additional upkeep step after this step so what's really really nice about this is you can use it on yourself to make it so that it's practically suspend two instead of suspend four on all of these things or if you one of your opponents has something with like cumulative upkeeps or stuff like that you just chuck it on them and go now they're paying even more so it's a win-win all right moving on to our next section as you saw those were all the things that interacted with suspend but what exactly are we suspending it would be really dumb for us to have all these interactions for suspend without you know suspending anything so something we've noticed is big eldrazi's they're cheap they're really good Two of our best ones in this deck, of course being on budget, are Artisan of Kozilek and Desolation Twin. Because these ones are really cool because even if they get countered or destroyed or something, you're still getting their cast triggers off the suspend. So with Artisan of Kozilek, you get to return a creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. And that Annihilator 2 just racks up over the game. Big scary threat for dirt cheap. With Desolation Twin, when you cast him, you get a 10-10 Eldrazi creature token, which is really good. I mean, it, that's a big body. It does not get much bigger than that. And to have two of them is just absurd. It's a game-winning card, and for very cheap at around the 70 cent mark. Bane of Balagad and Ulamog's Crusher, they are both really, really good and cheap cards, both around the quarter mark. With Bane of Balagad, the defending player exiles two permanents they control rather than sacrificing, so it's a pseudo-annihilator too, but exile instead of graveyard. And Ulamog's Crusher is just an annihilator too that has to attack each turn. Conduit of Ruin, awesome card because it lets you search out your big threats and reduce the cost of the first creature spell you'd cast each turn. Breaker of Armies, really good for that final swing through because everything will have to block him while uh, all your other creatures are easily able to get through. Deep Sea Kraken and Inkwell Leviathan, we're not limiting ourselves just to Eldrazi here today, we're throwing in some big sea monsters because who doesn't love them? Deep Sea Kraken only being a 6-6, making him a smaller body, but what's really cool is that you can suspend him as is for with nine counters or you can just use Joyra's ability for two mana suspend for four so when an opponent casts a spell if he's suspended you remove their time counter from it so you can get a six six for two mana real easily as long as your opponents are casting spells then with inkwell leviathan once again you just suspend with Joyra. four turns later you get a 7-11 with trample isle and lock and shroud good luck getting rid of that one uh, Stormtide Leviathan and Fleece Waller. We got some more fishes coming to play. Stormtide Leviathan, 8 8 Island Walk. All lands are islands into addition to their other types, and creatures without flying or island walk can't attack. A real game ender right there. And I know we don't have a lot of creatures that have island walk or flying in here, but him on his own is just enough because your opponents probably aren't going to have that much with flying or island walk either. So it's just a real showstopper. Fleet Swallower, the big old millfish, 7 mana for a 6-6 six, six that every time he attacks you just halfway deck your opponent. Nasty card and dirt cheap at only a quarter. Combustible Gear Hulk and Sahili's Artistry. Sahili's Artistry simply is honestly only here because I didn't know where else in the presentation to put it but it's in the deck and I thought might as well put it something with something it interacts well with. Combustible Gearhawk, first strike, 6 mana, 6-6. Six, six. When he enters, target opponent may have you draw 3, or you mill 3, and then deal damage to them equal to the total CMC of the 3. What's really cool with these two's interactions is you cast Combustible Gearhawk, then you cast Sahili's Artistry, and you can get two copies, since it says one or both, and he's an artifact and a creature. So, you can be drawing 9, or you can be milling 9, or any combination of the two. So you can either be accidentally wiping out your opponent's life total in one go, or drawing enough hands to really get you started on the suspend train again. Then we're moving on to some board wipey like stuff. Steel Hellkite and Bearer of the Heavens. With Steel Hellkite, he's really cool because he's in a colorless Shivan Dragon, so to speak. 
but also has the ability to destroy each non-land permanent with converted mana cost to X or less whose controller was dealt combat damage by Steel Hellkite this turn. So he can just wipe out a board. Uh, and with Baron in the Heavens, he quite literally wipes everything. He's just an 8 mana, 10 10, big old body, but if he dies, everything goes with him. Your opponent's stuff, your stuff, everything. Not just non lands, too, so you're gonna lose all your lands. But luckily for us, being Joyra as the commander, we tend to recover a lot faster than any of the other decks are. Moving on, speaking of board wipes, we are throwing an obliterate in here because we're pretty much masochists. It can't be countered, it destroys all artifacts, creatures, and lands, and they cannot be regenerated. It is a, a raw board wipe. It'll make your opponents very, very upset. Alright, we also have some pseudo board wipes, more like uh, bouncing effects, cyclonic rifts of sorts, except we're on a budget, and that would be a quarter of our budget if we were to buy it. Devastation Tide and Whelming Wave are what we're rocking here. Uh, they both just return a bunch of creatures back to hands. In Devastation Tides, it's actually all non-land permanents, and you can miracle it for two, so it's the closest thing we're going to get to a Cyclonic Rift on the budget. For Whelming Wave, it's four mana, and it returns all creatures to their owner's hands except for Krakens, Leviathans, Octopuses, and Serpents, so it'll keep our big fish out if we need it to. Archaeomancer and Swiftfoot Boots. And swift foot and boots, my apologies. Um, these are both here for sakes of protection and recursion. Archaeomancer can get back our big instants and sorceries that we want to be casting again, and then swift foot boots will keep Joyra safe. I'd be running Lightning Greaves here, but once again, we are on a budget, and Lightning Greaves is around $5, which is just a little bit too pricey for this ultra budget. But if you've got one lying around, throw it in here, it's really useful. Up next, we have our counter spells to help keep us safe. We have counter flux and counter spell here. With counter flux, it's really good for just stopping those counter wars in general. So, say you got all four players at the table playing blue like the bunch of degenerates that they are, and they're just wanting to counter everybody's stuff because, you know, that's the best way to play magic. Don't let anyone play. Like you just throw this down and overload it, and you remind you, uh, you remind all your buddies who's the one with the real balls at the table, and put them all back into their place where they belong. And then there's Counterspell. Plain and simple, my least favorite card in the game. To follow it up, Unwind. It counters the target non-creature spell and lets you untap up to three lands. It's nice. It's mainly in here just because Joy was in the artwork and the flavor text. Negate counters non-creature spell. It's a budget counter spell. Mana leak counter target spell unless its controller plays three. This is that kind of counter spell that when you play it on someone, they'll just be really, really upset at you because it's a budget counter spell and something probably expensive just got countered with it. Essence scatter it counters a creature spell. Straightforward. Dissolve an arcane denial. They counter and then let you mess with your library a little bit. Dissolve counters target spell and you scry one. Arcane Denial counters target spell, but you're, the controller of the spell gets to draw up to two cards at the beginning of the next turn's upkeep, and then you draw a card at the beginning of the next turn's upkeep. And I know it seems strange, but <laughs> there have been times where I've countered my own stuff with Arcane Denial just to be able to draw three cards at the <laughs> next upkeep. Alright, next. Reality Shift and Is It Charm. Uh, not quite counter spells, I mean, is it charm technically is, but they both have some variety of removal. With Reality Shift, did exile target creature, its controller manifests top card of his or her library. In is it charm, you can deal two damage to a creature, counter a non creature spell unless its controller plays two, or draw two cards and discard two cards. All around useful. And then, there are Wild Ricochet and Insidious Will. Insidious Will, you can Counter target spell, choose new targets for a target spell, or copy target instant or sorcery spell and choose new targets. With Wild Ricochet, you may choose new targets for target instant or sorcery spell, then copy that spell. You may choose new targets for the copy. So that one's really cool because it <laughs> sends it right back at him and then decides, ooh, I like this, let's send it right back at him again. Moving on to the next section. Our card draw engines. 
because, well, obviously, we're going to need some card draw if we're going to want to get all this stuff out so fast since we're dropping it for cheap. So we have the classic cantrips, Brainstorm and Ponder. They're, one way or another, they're drawing us a good amount of cards here for Brainstorm. You draw three, then put two on top of your, from your hand on top of your library in any order you please. Amazing for one mana. Ponder. Look at top three of your library, put them back in any order, shuffle library, draw a card. You may shuffle library. I should put that in there because that is really important. Factor Fiction and Impulse. They're ones that let you look at a good chunk of the top of your library. In Factor Fiction's case, it lets uh, your, you choose an opponent, they separate it into two piles, and you put a pile into your hand and the other in your graveyard. Impulse, you look at the top four and put one in hand, the rest on bottom. Plain and simple. Overflowing Insight and Treasure Cruise. There are higher mana uh, draw spells, although Treasure Cruise usually you'll be casting for one mana after delving a bunch of cards, unless you draw three. Overflowing Insight, you make a target player draw seven. I've used this to win the game before when my opponent was really low on cards in their deck. Works really well. And it just, in your case, when you draw it for yourself, you're just refilling your hand with gas, so it's great. And then finally for our card draw, we have our Mercurial Chemister, the really, really confused human wizard. You can pay your blue and tap him to draw two, or pay a red and tap him and discard a card, and he'll deal damage equal to target two target creature equal to the discarded card CMC. And we have a lot of high CMC stuff in here, so he can often just be used to just start killing stuff. Alright, moving on to the next part, our combos, because we are a bunch of degenerates. We have Omniscience and Enter the Infinite, the most degenerate combo there is out there for us budget players. Omniscience is our most expensive card in the deck at about the $6 mark, and Enter the Infinite's about $2. But what's cool is you pop that Omniscience, then you pop the Enter the Infinite, and you literally just flip your library over onto the table and say, yeah, I have all of this. To follow it up, that is not the only combo, so to speak, that we are running in this deck. We are also running Niv Mizzet Curiosity, which is Niv Mizzet the Firemine. Whenever you draw a card, he deals damage to a target creature or player. You can tap him to draw a card. And Curiosity says whenever enchanted creature deals damage to an opponent, you may draw a card. So, what happens here? You put Curiosity on Niv Mizzet, then tap him, and then literally draw your entire deck and deal damage to it. He damage equal to it to the players of your choice. And that's the only two combos we're running in the deck because we don't hate everyone that much and we're trying to keep budget. Those combos aren't on the budget. Moving on, we have our locks. They're kind of like combos, but they're not. I don't know. I guess it's more combos. I'm sorry. I just like combos. We got Teferi here and he is an absolute bomb. Truly an all-star for the deck. Five mana, three, four with flash. Creature cards you own that aren't on the battlefield have flash. Each opponent can cast spells only at sorcery speed. So what's cool with this is he has some interactions. He's already bad enough as is, but when you play either of these cards, your opponents are done playing spells for the rest of the game. In Possibility Storm's case, you are too. Now with Knowledge Pool though, um, you're able to... I apologize for putting this in a live video because I know I'm not going to edit it out, but this is only each opponent, so that means you can cast it. I've been playing it wrong for years. I've been using Possibility Storm with Teferi for... Wow. I used this in a modern deck and I didn't realize I can cast off of it too. Right? Yeah. Huh. I apologize for this sudden revelation. But with both of these, yeah, your opponents are done casting spells, and then whenever you cast spells, well, you, you still get to cast your spells. With Knowledge Pool, it imprints when it enters. Each player exiles top three cards of the library, and whenever a player casts a spell from their hand, they exile it. And then if they do, they may cast another non-land card exiled with Knowledge Pool without paying its mana cost. And Possibility Storm, oh, what a fun card. I actually played it in Modern for a time because I'm bad at this game. But whenever a player casts a spell from their hand, they exile it, then exile cards from the top of their library until they exile a card that shares a card type with it. That player may then cast the card without paying its mana cost. Then he or she puts all cards exiled with Possibility Storm on the bottom of his or her library in a random order. 
then we're moving on to a little more chaos because yeah we, we really hate ourselves. Wild Evocation and Scrambleverse. With Wild Evocation, at the beginning of each player's upkeep, they reveal a card at random from his or her hand. If it's a land, it's onto the battlefield. Otherwise, cast it for free. Scrambleverse. For each non-land permanent, choose a player at random. Then each player gains control of each permanent for which he or she was chosen. Untap those permanents. That card typically just ends the game because people don't want to just shove their cards all around the table and forget who has what. Along with Scrambleverse, we have Warp World. Each player shuffles all permanents he or she owns into his or her library, then reveals that many cards from the top of his or her library. Each player puts all artifact, creature, and land cards revealed this way onto the battlefield, then does the same for enchantment cards, and puts all cards revealed this way that weren't put onto the battlefield on the bottom of his or her library. This card and Scrambleverse more than often tend to backfire, but my goodness are they just so much fun and they're high CMC so they rarely see play, but wait, we have Jorga, so we're just really getting to go to town with these dumb cards and watching the faces on the table as we play them. What a good time. Alright, moving on next we have our Mana Rocks, because we gotta get this going somehow and well, we like to see it going fast, and if we can't get Joyra out, we need to ramp into all this big stuff. So to start it off, the granddaddy of all mana rocks, Soul Ring. This thing is an auto include in pretty much any commander deck you're going to play, so obviously I'm going to be putting it in this one. To follow it up, we also have Izzet Signet and Mind Stone. Mind Stone's nice because it lets you draw a card in exchange for paying one and sacrificing. Commander Sphere lets you add mana of any color in Commander's color identity, and you can sack it to draw a card when you need to. Warren Power Stone is just really bad Soul Ring, but on a really good budget. Everflowing Chalice, you multi-kick it, and for each counter on it, you just tap for that much colorless. Is it Clue Stone's a bad mana rock, but it, you know, it taps for the colors we need, and you can pay a red and a blue and sacrifice it to draw a card. So it's not really that bad, especially for the cheap budget we're on. Well, that seems to be it for our mana rocks. Moving on to our land base. The best land in this deck is Command Tower, so to speak. It taps for both of our colors and comes in untapped, so that is always really nice. To follow that up, we have Izzard Boiler Brooks, our bounce land. So, Swift Water Cliffs, our life land. Guildgate and Highland Lake, they're just basic tap lands because we're poor. Lonely Sandbar and Forgotten Cave, they're cycling land, so you can get your card draw in the late game when you don't really need a land, or in the early game when you need a better land. Vivid Crag and Creek, they're the charge counter lands, not really too great in here, but you know, it's something and it's cheap. Terramorphic, and evol Terramorphic Expanse and Evolving Wilds are fetch lands of the deck, that's right, we're rocking the two best fetch lands ever printed, right? Not. Anyways. Temple of the Pulse God and Rogue's Passage. Temple of the Pulse God taps for two, but only if you have five or more lands. Not exactly the greatest land out there in the early game, but in the late, mid to late game, it really does its job well. Rogue's Passage taps for colorless, but you can pay four and tap to make it so a creature can't be blocked this turn. Really good for those big threats you're getting in the late game just to make sure they get through. Sanctum of Ugin and Desolate Lighthouse. These actually are probably our best lands in the deck. With Sanctum of Ugin, it just taps for color. Well, generic. I guess it's colorless. Yeah, they eroded that. And whenever you cast a colorless spell with CMC 7 or greater, you can sacrifice it. And if you do, you search your library for a colorless creature card, reveal it, and put it into your hand, then shuffle your library. Really good card, and once we get one of our Eldrazi's, we get to grab another. Desolate Lighthouse, taps for colors, but you can pay a 1, a blue, and a red to draw a card, then discard a card. It's really nice filtering for when you're getting those cards in the late game that you just don't want. Alright, then we also have our Halimar Depths and Wondering Funeral. Halimar Depths is kind of like a pseudo-index slapped on a tap land. And then Wandering Fumeral is our man land. It enters tapped and taps for blue or red, or you can pay 4 mana to turn it into a 1-4 that you can pay 0 to switch its power and toughness until end of turn. Alright. And that does it for our deck. 
that is the entire thing, and thank you so much for bearing with my horrible audio and editing quality as we went through this first episode of many on our wonderful adventures. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe if you enjoyed it, comment, share it with your friends, or you just laugh at me and, you know, call me mean names in the comments. That really works, too. Whatever the case may be, thank you so much for watching all the way to the end. Love you so much. Talk to you soon. Thank you.